voudrais bien que tous ces bons vieillards serions dans le paradis. Je voudrais bien que tous ces bons vieillards serions dans le paradis. Et que toutes les bonnes vieilles serions tailleurs, chaîne compagnie. Cela m'irait, cela m'irait jouer. The culture of Cape Breton Island, located in the Canadian province of Nova Scotia, is an amalgam, the mixing together of traditions and backgrounds over the course of the last 200 years. For those of us who were born and raised in Cape Breton, chances are that we descend from the English, Gales, Acadians, or Mi'kmaq. These people who first called Cape Breton home so very long ago over the generations have left their own unique mark on the cultural fabric of the island. These cultures have survived in some form or another in Cape Breton because of the courage and tenacity of its people. But truth be told, if we're going to discuss culture in Cape Breton, we need to address an anomaly that simply doesn't fit with our modern-day interpretation of what Cape Breton Island is, Louisbourg and the colony of Ile Royale. To visit the Fortress of Louisbourg National Historic Site is to step into a reality so distant from our own that for many, it might as well have never existed at all. In our own backyard, literally for some Cape Bretoners, three nations marched onto those boggy meadows beneath the walls of the fortress toward their destinies. The French toward revolution, the British toward empire, and the Americans toward independence. Why is it so difficult to define the cultural impact that the fortress of Louisbourg and the French colony of El Royale has had on Cape Breton? The answer is simple. There is no one left to culturally remember Louisbourg and what happened during the years that Cape Breton Island was a colony of France. For the most part, the English, Gales, Acadians and Mi'kmaq are able to claim an unbroken line of descent, going back centuries, but this is simply not so for the French citizens who lived in Ile Royale during the Ancien Regime nearly three centuries ago. Mais à présent je m'en réprends car je pourrais peut-être bien mentir. Mais à présent je m'en réprends car je pourrais peut-être bien mentir. Regardez l'un, regardez l'autre, regardez les comme elles se font rire. Cela m'irait, rêver, cela m'irait. Welcome to the Lost World of Cape Breton podcast series. It's the goal of this project to delve into the world of early 18th century Cape Breton Island, when it was known as the Colony of Ville Royale. Through personal journals, memoirs, and correspondence from the 18th century, we will reconstruct the lives of people long gone, walk the roads that no longer exist, and retell events from a reality so very different from the one that the people of Cape Breton now know. The podcasts are based on 18th century documentation, and it is our hope that these productions will bring back to life long-forgotten moments from Cape Breton's past. Our first podcast concerns a man named John Montresor, an engineer in the British Army, and later chief engineer in America during the American War of Independence. In a time when people generally didn't travel more than 30 miles from their homes, this man saw more of the North American continent than many of us who live in North America presently. From the colonial frontier of the Appalachian Mountains to the cobblestone streets of New France and then to the bustling city centers of the American colonies, Montresor seems to have always had a front row view to history in the making. His career spanned three tumultuous decades, beginning in the 1750s and ending in the 1770s, and carried him into some of the defining moments of American and Canadian history. Miriam Tuba, writing for the New York Historical Society, aptly describes his everywhere footprints. Montresor was born in Gibraltar on the 22nd of April, 1736, to James Gabriel Montresor, also an engineer in the British Army, and Mary Hoswell. Before arriving in America with his father, 
He had spent some time in Menorca, as well as London, England, where he received his education. It was soon after his arrival in America that he joined a disastrous expedition to Fort Duquesne in 1755, later dubbed Braddock's Defeat. And so began 20 or so years of traveling in the British Army. Throughout the span of his travels, Montresor kept his pen and paper close, preserving his movements and escapades across the land. Despite the passing centuries, a good chunk of his writings still exist in the form of Montresor journals, allowing readers to take an episodic glimpse of the past in all its vivid realness. It's in his earlier journal entries that we actually find him at the Second Siege of Louisbourg on Cape Breton Island in the spring and summer of 1758, serving as a practicing engineer working on the British siege works just outside the fortress walls. His journal entries go on to depict a fairly routine and ordinary 18th century style siege, culminating in the capture of Louisbourg and the colony of Ile Royale. It's his next journal entry, however, that piques our interest. Montresor writes, March 27, 1759. Journal of a route from Louisbourg to Lake Labrador, taken with a pocket compass, and the distances computed with what remarks and observations it could be obtained at that season, as it was winter and the snow nearly five feet in depth. One officer, 26 rangers, and three private men of the 45th Regiment were detached from the garrison to proceed on an inland scout, directing to Lake Labrador, from thence to a point La Jeunesse, so to cross the lake again to Labadec, bearing north from thence, where there is a small straggling settlement near the Sawmill River, to bring in what French Acadians we could find inhabiting those parts. And so Montresor sets out on this inland scout with the goal of crossing the Bredore Lakes, taking notes on everything he sees, and allowing us to peer into the landscape and infrastructure of rural Cape Breton some 250 years ago. The party sets out from Louisbourg on the Grand Chemin de Miré, or what this podcast will call the Great Myra Road. This was a well-built road, constructed in the 1730s by French engineers, that ran from Louisbourg out to the Myra River, linking the many property owners in that area to the colony's capital. With over 25 bridges and at least 10 feet wide, this road was a critical piece of infrastructure for 18th century Cape Breton. It allowed movement to and from the interior of the island for hunters, landowners, millers, and also for couriers bringing official correspondence between Canada and Ile Royale. It is interesting to note that parts of the Great Myra Road have survived down to our day, although some areas have become overgrown and inundated over the centuries. They continue and pass by Four Mile House through an area known as Cabinet Planchy, then by Portex Farm and onward past present-day 12 Mile Lake to La Calerti, settling into a barn where they would camp overnight. No doubt it was actually Joseph Lartigue's property, a member of Louisbourg's Superior Council and judge in Louisbourg's only bail of court, located somewhere in the vicinity of today's Fiddler Lake on the Gabarus Highway. It is sobering to imagine what life must have been like, living 15 or so miles into the middle of an empty forest, your nearest neighbors living many miles in either direction. The party is awakened the next morning by a storm, a mixture of snow and sleet, making their passage over the five feet of snow that had already fallen throughout the winter that much more difficult. As they continue their approach to the Myra River, Montresor describes passing through the burnt-out villages of Rouillé and the village des Allemands in his journal. This spot was generally called by the French Les Déserts, the land being open and free from trees. These houses were built with logs and plastered, with small enclosures picketed in and parallel to the road. This village is terminated by the sawmill creek that runs out from the pond into the Lake Mireille. 
After crossing the bridge commences another village called by the French Village de Rouillé, burnt, situated on the ascent of Devil's Mountain. Both villages had been the ambitious plan of the Count de Raymond, Louisbourg's eccentric governor from 1751 to 1753, who was determined to settle soldiers on the Myra to help supply Louisbourg with grain. Some of the more questionable men from the garrison took him up on his offer, and he named the village after the French minister of the marine, Rouillé. Village des Allemands, on the other hand, was settled by a group of German migrants from the Palatine and rural regions of Germany, giving us an idea of Cape Breton's diversity during this period. It seems that both villages, likely some 30 houses in total, were burnt to the ground to avoid them being used by the British during the spring of 1758. Although there is no neighborhood that corresponds to the location of these two villages today, the modern-day French village lake gives us a hint as to where they were actually situated. Montresor and the scouting party then crossed the frozen Myra River on foot, truly beginning their trek out of civilization and into the deep unexplored interior of Cape Breton. Not far away, a furnished home sits abandoned slowly filling with snow. Here they make use of another one of Count de Raymond's ambitious plans, the Chemin Raymond or Raymond's Road, a communication trail that ran close to 15 miles from the north shore of the Myra across the Brador Mountains to the shores of the Brador Lakes, ending in the vicinity of modern-day Big Pond or Benyon. Crosses with the words Chemin inscribed on them had been placed every 12 miles along the road, presumably as a distance marker, and Montresor notes the first of the markers were installed on the north shore of the river. Along with the Rouillé Road, which ran from modern-day Bedeck to St. Anne's, and a portage road cleared in St. Peter's, it allowed quick communication between the three principal settlements of Cape Breton Island, but they were highly criticized at the time for being strategically flawed. Two days later, having climbed the Brador Mountains, Montresor makes record of their party standing at the summit, looking down onto the Brador Lakes only a quarter of a mile away. Having stopped, no doubt, to rest for a bit, Montresor takes the time to mark in his journal the location of a grave they had discovered atop the summit. Monsieur Lavue de Jambon engineer employed making the road to St. Anne's. Who was this engineer? Where is the exact location of his grave? It's doubtful anyone today knows. It's likely that the brief notation Montresor gives us about this grave is the only record of this man's existence we have today. This little passage in Montresor's journal is so very interesting because it helps us grasp what happens when the human elements of a society are interrupted by upheaval. Entire lives slip through the cracks and are forgotten. Entire histories disappear. In the end, John Montresor never did complete his inland scout to the Sawmill River. The ice had thawed too much to be able to safely cross the lakes, and so he returned to Lewisburg. It could be said that the most successful thing he did during this week of traveling to the interior of Cape Breton Island was leave for us a small glimpse into a community whose stories people can no longer tell. Much like Montresor and his scouting party, it was in that era that many of the cultural histories of the French in Nil Royale came to a dead end. Quand j'étais su mon père, quand j'étais su mon père.